Hi, my name is Brad Constantine, and this is a podcast of the New Testament. I'll be using as the text the King James Version, along with the Joseph Smith Translation. Although this is not an official recording of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, every effort's been made to be as doctrinally accurate as possible. I'll also be using quotes from general authorities of the Church, the Apostles and Prophets, and BYU professors and others, and uh, every word out of the Scriptures themselves. So if you're ready for a really detailed analysis of the New Testament, you've come to the right place. Welcome. Hi there, welcome back. This is going to be for 2 Corinthians chapter 4. So I'll read the heading first. Gospel light shines on the saints. Mortal trials are nothing as compared or as contrasted with eternal glory. Verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. What is the mystery? It is that Christ dwells in the hearts of those who have crucified the old man of sin, and that as a consequence they have a hope of eternal glory. Such is what the Lord requires of his children in working out their own salvation with fear and trembling before him. And it is in their, it is in this connection that Paul says somewhat caustically, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, hidden from the world, but revealed in the hearts of those who are enlightened by the Spirit. This doctrine becomes the measuring rod by which the saints determine whether they are faithful and true. Verse 4, that was by Elder Bruce Amakonki. Verse 4, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. John Taylor said, Satan exerts an invisible agency over the spirits of men, darkens their minds, and uses his infernal power to confound, corrupt, destroy, and envelop the world in confusion, misery, and distress. And although deprived personally of operating with a body, he uses his influence over the spirits of those who have bodies to resist goodness, virtue, purity, intelligence, and the fear of God, and consequently the happiness of man and and poor, erring humanity is made the dupe of his wiles. The apostle says, The God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. But not content with the ravages he has made, the spoliation, misery, and I didn't know that was a word, the spoliation, misery, and distress, not having a tabernacle of his own, he has frequently sought to occupy that of man in order that he might yet possess greater power and more fully accomplish the devastation. Verse 5, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants, for Jesus' sake, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, but the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Paul had seen the face of Jesus Christ, but such a divine manifestation, Paul had learned firsthand of the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. By such a divine manifestation, I mean. This firsthand knowledge is the treasure spoken of. It is a privilege that can be enjoyed in mortality while still inhabiting an earthen vessel. Of all the treasures of godliness, all of all the rewards of righteousness, this is the greatest, even a personal knowledge of the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. It is interesting how indirectly Paul speaks of such a profound experience. His words can be interpreted in other ways, but those sensitive to the Spirit will understand the veiled meanings. Similarly, in our day, when the apostles and prophets speak of their testimony of the Savior, their language is slightly different than ours. The difference is subtle, but a, a discerning heart understands that they speak of a personal knowledge obtained through a holy interaction with the Savior himself. They have the same treasure Paul spoke of, for they have personally gained a knowledge of the glory of God while yet inhabiting an earthen vessel, such as the second comforter, a needed comfort when troubled on every side, perplexed, persecuted, and cast down. Verse 8, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, 
that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then it worketh death unto us, but life unto you. We, having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken, we also believe, and therefore speak. Knowing that he which raised, raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. In other words, Christ was resurrected and so will we be resurrected. For we bear all things for your sakes that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Orson Pratt said, Having been married for eternity, we die, and our spirits go into celestial paradise. We come forth in the morning of the first resurrection as immortal males and immortal females. Our wives, married to us for eternity, come forth, and they are ours by virtue of that which God has pronounced upon them through those whom he has appointed and to whom he has given authority. We have a legal claim upon them at the resurrection, but here comes forth a person that is married outside. She comes up without a husband, he without a wife, or any claim upon any of the blessing. blessings. Here is the difference between these two classes of beings, one having lost what they might have obtained and enjoyed if they had had faith in God and been willing to obey his commandments, but the others are worthy, as the Apostle Paul has said, to obtain a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while the others will be angels or servants to go and come at the bidding of those who are more exalted. Brigham Young said, All intelligent beings who are crowned with crowns of glory, immortality, and eternal lives must pass through every ordeal appointed for intelligent beings to pass through to gain their glory and exaltation. Every calamity that can come upon mortal beings will be suffered to come upon the few to prepare them to enjoy the presence of the Lord. If we obtain the glory that Abraham obtained, we must do so by the same means that he did. We must pass through the same experience and gain the knowledge, intelligence, and endowments that will prepare us to enter into the celestial kingdom of our Father and God. Every trial and experience you have passed through is necessary for your salvation. It is recorded that Jesus was made perfect through suffering. If he was made perfect through suffering, why should we imagine for one moment that we can be prepared to enter into the kingdom of rest with him and the Father without passing through similar ordeals? John Taylor said, I heard the prophet Joseph say, I, in speaking of the, to the twelve on one occasion, you have all kinds of trials to pass through, and it is quite as necessary for you to be tried as it was for Abraham and other men of God. And said he, God will feel after you, and he will take hold of you and wrench your very heartstrings. And if you cannot stand it, you will not fit. You will not be fit for an inheritance in the celestial kingdom of God. George Q. Cannon taught, Every Latter-day Saint who gains a celestial glory will be tried to the very uttermost. If there is a point in, your, in our character that is weak and tender, you may depend upon it that the Lord will reach after that, and, he will be tri and, and we will be tried at that spot, for the Lord will test us to the utmost before he can get through, before we can get through and receive that glory and exaltation which he has in store for us as a people. Orson F. Whitney said, No pain that we suffer, no trial that we experience is wasted. It ministers to our education, to the development of such qualities as patience, faith, fortitude, and humility. All that we suffer and all that we endure, especially when we endure it patiently, builds up our characters, purifies our hearts, expands our souls, and makes us more tender and charitable, more worthy to be called the children of God. And it is through sorrow and suffering, toil and tribulation, that we gain the education that we come here to acquire, and which will make us more like our Father and Mother in heaven. Verse 18, while we look not at the things which, we, which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So that's the end of the chapter, and I hope you got something out of that, and we'll see you next time. Bye.